this is more informational than, than cute, which is like, totally goes against the grain of most of my thoughts. So. Who am I? A bit about myself. Um, recently joined Hewlett Packard's Cloud Computing Group, and so building out some cool tools like those that you probably already use. So keep an eye out for that. By the way, we're hiring, so uh, we're ramping up our team over the, the next couple of months. So if you're interested in, in the cloud, whatever that means these days, and you're sling Ruby, then, then let me know. Also, we have a podcast called The Change Log. So who has open source projects up on GitHub? Hopefully everybody. Cool. Anybody have anything to be featured on The Change Log? Okay, well, there you go. So one wave. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Move closer to you on a t-shirt. All right. Purpose of this talk. I write API wrappers. Kind of what I do. Sunday afternoons when I'm pitching out in front of football. A lot of API wrappers. It started when uh, we were consuming the Twitter API for an application we called, called Tweet Congress. That uh, was a directory and an uh, aggregate of all the congressional uh, U.S. Senate and, and House tweeters and uh, compiled all their tweets and, and just had a directory so you could find your congressman on, on Twitter. And we were submitting a lot of patch requests. John Maker created the, the Twitter gem. And I think that uh, got to be kind of a nuisance for John. So he said, well, hey, why don't you just take this thing and run it? It seems you seem to be more uh, interested in it than I am. So I maintain the, the Twitter gem. Uh, now, that led to, to LinkedIn, uh, a gym I wrote called Octopussy, which um, was inspired about Octopi and some others, but I really didn't care for how they wrapped the GitHub API, so I wrote one called Octopussy. Formstack, Charge to Five, the list goes on and on. Too long, probably. So, why create API wrappers in the first place? I mean, we've got curl. Curl's a great way of interacting with. API, just pass the URL and you get some JSON back or XML, God forbid. There's also net HTTP. So you can do the same thing in Ruby without having to drop out the system. But we're Rubyists. We don't want to deal with those low level libraries. We want more Ruby in our API. So idiomatic access. A lot of this comes from uh, a post that Chad Fowler, Fowler wrote back in, um, I guess, 2007 or so. There was a big debate between our Facebook and Facebooker at the time, and uh, approaches that each of those took. So what I mean by idiomatic access, well, let's say we have a JSON hash that's returned, and this turns into a Ruby hash. And notice the camel casing keys. I mean, you can still consume it, but it's just ugly if you're, if you're dealing with Ruby, right? So we want those Ruby five. Show you some tricks to do that later. So you know, one of the, the cool things about writing an API wrapper is you can give the data to the language that is consuming it and something that feels a little bit more natural. So we take those camel cases and go to underscore. It seems to be the convention. I don't know if Ruby set the page, but in the JSON world, it seems to be the convention for key names. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see a PHP service or a Java service expose those key names in camel casing because that's how they are behind the, the API. The same is true for, for method names. So if we have an API method that's user get info by email, I think I took this from the dig API, we could expose info by email. It's just a little bit more idiomatic Ruby. There's also syntactic sugar. We're used to this in, in Ruby. So the arrow functions that are in Rails 3 now that we can do these big chain methods to uh, create the database. We do the same thing. Here's a, a case from the Twitter gem to do a search. So we can chain methods together to build our search. In this case, we're calling uh, for all tweets that are from Johnny and Maker to me, hash with Ruby. And it actually doesn't compose the URL to be called fetch, and then it, it performs the search. So method chaining is a big thing that we can do with just the dynamic nature of Ruby. Also see this in action in the Remixer gem, which is a wrapper for the Best Buy gem. We have method chaining here as well. What's cool about this one is uh, Remixer and your APIs, you know, in the world of REST, we, we typically think, okay, we have a REST API and it returns JSON. But that REST 
term is really loose. And there's a lot of API styles out there that return JSON. In the case of Best Buy, they, they have a really crazy way that they compose URLs to do things like finding all of the stores within a given radius of a zip code and returning all the products that uh, the sales price is greater than $3,000 in this case. They even have it where you could reverse those terms and find all the products that are greater than $3,000, but then return the stores that have them. So uh, it's cool to be able to in Ruby construct those in different methods and call, have method chaining, construct your URL and fly on the way out, regardless of how it's called. This is another technique. Uh, I haven't seen Hayes here, but Hayes Davis is a local Rubyist. Uh, he's got a Twitter client called Grackle, which is cool. Uh, he takes a, a different approach. He has method chaining here to construct the URL. So notice the client.statuses.update.json. It follows the Twitter API, the, the REST URL. But he adds the bang there for post. So if you call it without the bang, it's a get. Call it with the bang, it's a post. Very natural for the reason. There's also different approaches when you're building a, an API wrapper. So there's simple wrapping. So in this case, uh, Michael Bly from Entridia has Twitter off, so you can authenticate via Twitter, and also that user now um, is a pseudo client that you can call the, the Twitter API and, and do some things on behalf of the, an authenticated user. So he uses wrapping here, and notice you're passing in the URL endpoint statuses update JSON, uh, and you're passing the status of tweet tweets, we're going to tweet from, from Twitter off. Now Grackle, Hayes takes a different approach we just saw. We call this wrapping with styles, Buzz Lightyear would say. And then abstraction. John takes a totally different approach with the, the Twitter gem in that he wanted something, he originally built it so that he could tweet from the command line, so what he wanted was just an update. So it hides the actual URL behind the scenes, and you don't have to know about the API you're calling. So why would you simply wrap? Well, the biggest thing is you can insulate against change. Your API and your client looks just like your API on the server. So if the API on the server changes, for the most part, your wrapper will keep up. And you don't have to, to recompile or, or uh, refactor the, the uh, API to keep up with that client side or the server side change. You can also leverage API documentation. So the documentation that the server side is pretty much one to one in the client side. So you get to reuse that documentation so they don't have a separate set of documentation. So then why would we abstract? What's the use case there? Or as Chad called it in his post, writing APIs for app APIs. Well, oftentimes in the case of Facebook, you might want to simplify a complex API and hide all that garbage underneath the, a, a, a facade so that you don't have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. You also might want to provide a business domain so if you wanted to cache internally, <coughs> provide some local value add in the way that you're consuming the API, you might want to to abstract the API. Tools of the trade, and this is kind of where I'll camp out because this seems to be where a lot of my research on weekends goes. Uh, transport layers. So we all know about NHTP as it's built into Ruby. Anybody know the problem with NHTP? Come on, somebody. It's not crazy. There you go. Who said that? So doing serial requests with an HTTP, you may have to make 10 requests, it's, it's difficult because that's going to be queued up and it, it becomes 10x however your, your requests are. So Patron uh, gets around this, but instead of using curl, you just look girls. Fill in the room or do you bail them? He bailed? <laughs> he knows about this stuff. So Phil Tolan has a library called a no shirt fill. Um, a library called Patron that uses look girl under the hood, gets around this. Tipius from Qualtics is another one that um, is, supports parallel out of the box. So a lot of sites, Amazon's a good example, when they compose their, their front end pages, they make numerous HTTP requests on the back end to compose that page. If they did all that serial, it would take much longer than when they parallelize it. Phrase, I guess. Uh, that becomes much quicker because then your request is only as long as your longest request. Another approach is the, uh, Event machine HTTP request from Ilya. Um, we've got this great debate going on in the community, community between threads and invented uh, type architectures. This is one to, to look at if you're using event machine. Another big aspect of writing Ruby wrappers after you decide on your transport layers is your parsing layer. So 
APIs normally return XML and JSON. Good APIs turn, return JSON. Who wants to deal with uh, XML and, and the type issues that they come with it? Crack is probably one of the more better known ones. It comes with HTTP party. Uh, crack will uh, parse XML and JSON. Not sure if it does YAML or not. Uh, but basically, this code was uh, code that John left out of Merv and Rails composed into a, a gem called Crack. And it puts the party in each part. <coughs> JSON, and there's JSON Pure, and there's also active support. Uh, if you just want to use um, Pure Ruby to, to parse JSON, that's also an option, although it, it can be slow. There's also Yagil Ruby, which um, drops down the C extensions to parse JSON, which is much, much faster. Um, we switched to this in the Twitter jam a while back. There's been some complaints because it doesn't play nice on Windows. So the Trinia guys come to the rescue again with multi-JSON, which is a gem that you can just, gives you one, it's got tilt for JSON, gives you one interface to, to parse JSON, and it looks for the quote unquote best library in the machine. It will look for uh, Yagile first, and then uh, JSON Pure, and then Active Support, and then down the line. Higher level library. So this is usually where, when you're writing an API, um, unless you, you're doing something extremely quick and dirty, you want to have a higher level uh, library to consume so you're not that close to the metal. So the, by far the most popular one after is probably HTTP party. Anybody using this? Yeah, after room. Uh, the John Newmaker, so this is the the guts of the Twitter gym. Uh, apparently, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so if you've ever installed anything that depends on HTTP party, you probably got this message, which uh, always makes me crack up when I install the, the latest version. So HTTP party gives you, it's a Ruby module where that you can include in your class, and it gives you basic wrappers for get, post, put, and delete, so your class basically turns into an HTTP client. Uh, wraps things like basic auth and um, a base URI, so you don't keep uh, passing the whole URL for your API endpoints instead of base URI, and then everything else from there is relative. Handles things like default params, like a lot of APIs will have tokens that need to be passed with every request or some sort of um, authentication scheme or um, identifier that every request needs to have so you can bundle those up in a default params. It uses net HTTP for transport, so it does have the, the serial problem, and it uses crack um, for parsing JSON and XML, which is both good and bad. So a, a sample HTTP party class, in this case, a delicious wrapper, include HTTP party, set your base URI, um, and then you can instantiate your class. And the recent method is just the wrapper for the post recent endpoint, passing in the, uh, the basic authentication we, we called at the top of the stack. It's also Monster Mash, which is a cute name. It basically is HTTP party for, for Tiffius. If you want to go for parallel support, REST client from Adam Wiggins is another approach that gives you a, kind of a DSL um, to compose your, your wrappers. It supports active resource out of the box, which is both good and bad. But if you're into that sort of thing, it also supports uh, nested resources um, so that you can just point it as an active resource endpoint and get a kind of fully ready to go wrapper out of the other side. Um, it has a built-in shell, which is really cool. So you can crank up a shell in the command line and interact with the service directly from the, the, the console, which is really nice. Weary from Mark Wunsch. This is one of my uh, ones to keep an eye on. It also gives you a simple DSL. Uh, what I like about it is you can specify required and optional parameters on the method level. <coughs> so um, for folks consuming an API that may not be an expert with the API they're consuming, um, this allows you to um, kind of mark up your your methods in a way that tells the, the consumer, hey, these uh, options are, are required, these options are optional, which can then be output into your documentation, which is really nice when you have a unique path to a method. Also includes async support, kind of a callback mechanism. So weary looks like this, I'll declare a method foo, in this case, and specify the URL. Um, whether the verb it wants to get, in this case, we're going to tell it to go via post. It requires parameters of ID and bar. It also has an optional one of blah. These are really helpful. 
authenticates uh, false and then follows redirects and I can specify some custom headers. That's another big thing in your uh, wrapping APIs. There's a lot of times you have to supply custom headers for things like authentication. So all of that turns into client.foo and gives you a method that you can call it in with an options hash. A different approach is rack client. So this takes rack that you're familiar with on the server, kind of brings it down to the client. So it gives you a rack API with request and response. So you make requests, and those can be queued up with middleware to act on those requests on the way out, and then responses on the way back in. Um, I'm not sure if it's actively developed. That was one of the reasons why I didn't jump into <coughs> to rack client and it's lightly documented. Um, about the same time, I discovered Faraday from TechMe, for Golson. It's given us so much in the community. It's also rack light supports middleware, which is really cool. Uh, he has the notion of adapters, so you can specify your transport on either per call or per library basis. So in this case, in the URL, we're hitting the, the uh, Twitter API, so we set our base URI, and you create with your Faraday connection based on that URL. I'm setting the adapter, the default adapter, so you can set that to NetHTTP, Tipius, uh, the whatever you want to use, and that is um, set once, so you don't have to worry about it. And then, in this case, I'm using um, some middleware for multi-JSON and Mashify, which we'll get to those in just a second. But on every base, uh, on the connection level, for every request, I'm going to have this middleware stack. So you can compose your client just like you do if you're composing a rack application. It's really nice. So then to call it, response equals the connection.get, which is your verb. Do request, you add optional overrides uh, that you need to do on a per-request basis. And you just call it. Easy peasy. So Faraday Middleware is uh, another uh, add-on to this that, that I've created to kind of bundle a lot of the, uh, a couple of the common patterns that I was doing, uh, repeating from wrapper to wrapper. So hashing, anybody use hashing? A few hands. Check it out if you do this sort of thing. So hashing is a method hash, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but I like to take it, so that I had to deal with bracket notation, I like to deal with more of an open struct method hash when I'm consuming data from an API, so Hashi does that, and then multi-JSON, again, we discussed, and do the multi-parsing. So it seems like every request that comes back, I want to parse the JSON in some way, turn into a, a method hash, so please do that. And then based on the API, you either need, sometimes you need OAuth or OAuth2, and so I can throw those in there as, as needed. So this is pretty much my, my current stack. So Hashi, Hashi, Makes full use of this thing. So, mash, dash, crash, and clash. And they can nothing if they even start to dive into each of these. So, mash is a method hash, as we mentioned. So, if I have a hash with, with bracket notation of a key of foo, I can then just call dot foo. And it doesn't use method missing or anything like that. I can uh, pull that back directly. What's cool about it is I can take a deep hash that comes from, a, from an API or some um, keys, values are hashes themselves, others are arrays, and it will do that deep. Um, traversal and, and parse, and I get object notation <coughs> as far as, as my object goes. Dash is just like mash, except instead of just being preformed that anything that's a key is now a, a method, if you want a more strongly typed hash, so to speak, you can explicitly set which properties in the top of your, of your dash uh, should be enabled. If you want to use some sort of encapsulation or something. So, trash is a translation hash, it's built on MASH. Um, the earlier example I showed where we would rubyfy those keys, this is where we would use that. So you can specify patterns where it takes camel casing keys and turns them into the underscore keys if that's how you want to consume it. And then Clash does the Errol type um, query building uh, pattern that we showed before where you can dive into the, into the hash and build those, those queries on the fly. Let's so check it out, I put the URL here. It's um, Intridia hashing on GitHub. Hurlit. Who's used Hurlit? Cool. So Hurlit, uh, you use Hurl in the command line. So Hurl is basically Hurl on the web. It's uh, entering the Rails Rumble last year, the year before. can't remember. Uh, this is Chris and, and Leah's entry last year, or whenever they made it. It's really cool that you can go in and put in your URL uh, for your API endpoint and test your API endpoints. So you can um, add parameters, add headers, and it comes back and it will 
can do syntax outline for the return JSON and XML. A lot of API um, documentation sites have something like this, this built in now. I know uh, Adam Gruel and the team has done this on their API Explorer, so these are really handy if you need to debug the API call and figure out problems with the API itself or in your mapper code. HTTP scoop, anybody played with this? So, cool. So if you um, need to figure out you know, what API call is actually being executed from your code, so sometimes when you're proposing these URLs on the fly and you're, and you're not sure uh, in your wrapper code that the problem is on your end or on the server end and you need to see exactly what's going back and forth, HTTP Scoop is just a, a Mac app that you can download and bind to a particular interface, either Ethernet or your airport, and it will listen to all network traffic, HTTP traffic, and show you a log. You can even uh, filter it by domain, wildcard domain, things of that sort. And then you click on each of these entries and you get a really nice request response formatted uh, JSON or XML uh, payload and headers that you can inspect and figure out uh, exactly what the problem is. It's great for debugging. Charles Proxy is another. It's really similar to HTTP Scoop. Anybody use this? So Charles is a, the same setup, it's in it just listening, it's a proxy server. So um, when the GoWalla iPhone app came out, I was dying to, uh, to play with the API and having those guys haven't gotten around to building it yet. So I was able to take the iPhone app, point it at my uh, laptop using Charles proxy and sniff all the calls. So then if you have an iOS app now or an Android app, native app, you pretty much have an API. You can even install certificates and things and yeah. sniff SSL traffic. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool to, uh, to be able to sniff out hidden APIs. Okay. I didn't check it from the Great Wall of China or anything like some other folks did. <coughs> testing. So a big piece of creating an API wrapper is, is testing. A um, big piece of my toolkit is fake web. FakeWeb allows you to, it's basically fixtures for your API calls. So you can use curl it or curl, grab your fixtures, dump them in the fixtures folder, and then um, stub out requests, put a URL in there, and say that uh, a call makes this URL and matches this URL parameter, uh, pattern, then serve up this fixture file instead. And you can lock it down and it'll throw an error to say, uh, telling you that you try to make a network request outside of the, anything that you stepped out. So you don't have to pound your API or your, or your testing and running your, your tests, which is pretty cool. <coughs> VCR is a project built on top of that. So FakeWeb, it's up to you to go get your fixture from your API. VCR allows you to configure a layer on top of FakeWeb that the first time they'll go out and grab the fixture, dump it to your fixtures folder, and then throw an error on subsequent, subsequent requests if you try to make the call again, which is really cool to auto-create those fixtures for you. The problem with these types of libraries is that they only um, allow you to test the parsing of the JSON of the XML that comes back. There's a lot that goes into an API call, <coughs> headers, responses, things of that sort, where you may need um, to really mock the server that you're testing against and not just depend on fixtures. Uh, some tools to do that are Artifice from um, Yehuda. So you basically activate a, uh, a rack app to spoof um, your API, and so you can kind of build a, a fake version of your API. Shamrack does the same thing, it's a great name. So I can rack up a, a Sinatra app and spoof my API. So um, this allows you to, to test against the local version of your app. And uh, you know, this was a, would be a great thing for, for folks building multiple applications on top of a well-known API to have these shams out there, a Twitter sham that everybody could test against without having to call Twitter, because that's destructive to actually send out tweets while you're, you're testing. Um, and then know that hey, if the API changes, then this is one point that, that we can manage that, that change. It also plays nice just as rack middleware. So uh, sham rack <coughs> is, is truly a, a rack application. So authentication seems to be a, a big um, issue when you're writing API wrappers. One of the, the biggest things, one of the biggest barriers of writing an API wrapper is just getting 
the authentication piece working. It seems like there's a number of ways that, that APIs do this. By far the easiest is just basic. It's not the most secure, but it's, it's the easiest. Somebody supports basic authentication. You can set a credentials file or something in your home folder and in, in your, your test we pull that up and, and use basic authentication as built into to Ruby and real, really straightforward. OAuth is a giant PIA, um, but it's more secure. Uh, OAuth allows you to um, let the providing site do the authentication instead of having its broker. So instead of dealing with the user name and password of the user, you now are given a set of tokens that expire or can be revoked. So it's a lot more secure for the user uh, in that case. Um, but the flows in OAuth 1 are incredibly complex. How do you get these, these tokens? Because you have a set of consumer keys for your application. You have to pass those uh, in. You get a, a pair of request keys. And you get a pair of access keys. And it's, it's a crazy flow, especially for mobile applications. So they've revamped this into OAuth 2. And other than uh, you know, the first five letters, they have nothing in common for the most part. Uh, so don't expect an easy upgrade path from OAuth to OAuth 2. Uh, if you need to do OAuth 2 applications, the Intridia OAuth 2 gem, which I think dropped the same day that OAuth 2 was announced, uh, is really great. Um, one of the things you run into with OAuth 2 is that OAuth 2 specifies different flows for different types of devices, where you have web flows and mobile flows and things of that sort, user agent flows they call The problem is a lot of the providers do the web flow and they stop. So if you're trying to do mobile applications, they don't uh, really have it all that fleshed out. That's pretty much it. Any questions on API wrappers? Is Twitter on OAuth 1 or 2? Twitter is on OAuth 1, and I'm not sure uh, as a service when they're going to upgrade to OAuth 2. And thanks for bringing that up. So we're currently in a refactor. We're taking the advantage of um, the OAuth Apocalypse, which may have already passed, I've been kind of a time over the last couple of weeks, where they're shutting off uh, the basic off, and they're going to go with co op only. Monday. Um, is a Monday. Because we don't want tomorrow to finish up the, uh, the refactor. So we're switching over to Faraday and Faraday Middleware just to uh, take the opportunity to, to cut half of the code. The, uh, the Twitter gem has, has really been an evolution of code, so we have different paths uh, using the portable pattern for basic flows and, and OAuth flows, and um, we're using this opportunity to really simplify that and go to Faraday and have just one, one flow for the application. Anybody else? Well, a couple of useful tools you mentioned are Wireshark and the REST client plugin for Firefox. Okay, cool. I'll check those out. In case you didn't hear that, it's Wireshark and the REST client plugin for Firefox. Um, another tool I was going to Response. Works like that, it will cache the request, but you can specify how long. So you can say, well, in case the API was going to break, I want to refetch all that data like once a week. Or okay. Like that. Um, Stores it in memory, where's the store? Uh, no, it'll, it'll cache it on the file system. 